Good morning, my dear friends. At the very outset, I would like to thank the organizers of today's uh, PES Bangalore South campus for having invited me to talk to all of you. Friends, India is a very young country. One out of four people in this country are like you and me, within uh, less than 30 years of age. And in a political democracy like ours, a parliamentary democracy like ours, the political system is the lifeline of the country. Every aspect of our country is affected by the health of this political system. Sadly, today, this one system, the political system which was intended and created to solve the problems of the country, has in itself become the biggest problem for the country. People say that youth, young people should get into politics. And then with more number of young people getting into politics, there's hope for the system to change. I have spoken and interacted with thousands of young people who, in, who are extremely keen on getting into the system to change the system for the better. But all of them are extremely apprehensive and say that the system inhibits, the system discourages them from getting into the system. We have a system where the sole determinant of success depends upon caste, money power and the influence of money or dynastic affiliations. Take the case of a young man who wants to get into a political system. He joins the youth wing of a particular party. No, none of our political parties have a decent and a formal stipend mechanism to encourage these sort of young people. Without such a system in place, this young man starts getting into wheeling dealings, pity corruptions, and that's how corruption is started at the very initial stage. Even though he puts in 10 years or decades of hard work for the party, the, if, if, when the time of the election comes, what, how, how, is the, how is it that the candidate is selected for the, who, who, for the elections? Who gets the party ticket? That one man who is born in a particular family, or that man who has enough control over money and who can bring enough money to the game of this politics gets the ticket. This is a system where meritocracy is not respected, where talent, for, where talent is not respected, in this system where hard work and sincerity is not rewarded. Can we ask our young people in this country, can we encourage them to get into a system like this? This problem of young people not being encouraged, not being welcomed by the political system is just a symptom of a larger malaise that is afflicting the, afflicting the body polity of this country. So what is this larger problem? The first past the post system that we are following in this country, dear friends, is encouraging people to group the population into splinters, into new groups across caste and religious lines. It is not encouraging or incentivizing parties and candidates to appeal to people on a broad-based appeal. Let me give an example of how representative our representative politics and democracy is. Supposedly in your area, there are 100, there are 100 votes, 100 electors. And the average turnout in our elections is about 50%. So consider that if you want to win this particular election where 50% of the 100 uh, have voted, if you can manage to get 20 to 20 people to vote for you, you can win. And how does this translate on the national picture? In the 15th Lok Sabha, that the present one that we are in, the two national principal parties of this country, the Congress and the BJP, got only 28% and 18% of the total national vote respectively. So here is a classic case of a minority of electors voting the majority of our electors, legislators. So how representative is this party, is this governance? And then we come to the second, second problem of dynasty. Can you believe that in the present Lok Sabha, there is not even one single person, not single parliamentarian in the 15th Lok Sabha below the age of 30 years who does not come from a political family. Not even one single honorable exception. And as far as those young people in the bracket of 30 to 40 years is concerned, 70% of them hail from political families. Can we have a David Cameron in India? Can we have a Barack Obama in India who without any strong political background rose to occupy the highest offices in their country based on the sheer merit of their talent, based on their sheer competence and capability? So what is this dynasty and these caste-based politics doing to the country? 
like all of you know the best friends of dynastic politics is mediocrity and psychophancy while the enemies of dynastic politics is meritocracy supposedly take a leader who is a leader because he is born in a particular family so what is the, what are the kind of leaders who he will encourage whom he will groom and what are the kind of leaders this dynastic leader will appoint to public offices and like all of us are aware most of the public offices in this country are appointed by our political leaders be it ias officers who are manning our departments or be it the local police inspector in the local thana starting from the managers of our sports clubs to the vice chancellors of our universities all of these are majorly political appointees so what kind of people will be appointed by this dynastic leader it is a it is but natural if you have second rate leader second rate people choosing a new set of people be very certain that the new set of people that they will be choosing will be third rate people so what are we getting in, this, in, in in turn institutions of public delivery institutions of governance in which excellence had to be given at most importance are crumbling every single day so this brings us to the third problem now because we are choosing our leaders based because he belongs to a particular caste he can control or appease a section of votes and because he is born in a political family this has resulted in the quality in the decline of the and deterioration of the quality of our institutions political parties and political leaders are not able to successfully deliver public goods and public services and now because they are failing in delivering public services they very efficiently deliver private services during the time of elections this brings us to the next problem of the humongous amount of money that we are spending in elections go and ask any any leg elected legislator legisl elected parliamentarian he'll accept in private the amount of money he has spent on elections it's humongous nothing less than 4 to 5 crores to win a assembly election and nothing short of 10 to 15 crores to win a parliamentary election so what is this corruption in election leading us to it is leading us to the next problem this corruption in this this whole corruption in ele elections is leading us and making the entire political system into a return on investment model so the one who wants to get into politics thinks that the best method of getting the best returns on his investment is to invest in politics and the moment he steps inside office the first method first step that he takes is to he reap the benefits of the office and then this whole rent seeking corruption and the nexus between the businessman the cop the uh, businessman the contractor the politician and the bureaucrat starts so what have we done of our system so the system is not representative enough this system is not putting power in the hands of people who have the competence the aptitude and integrity to lead this country forward more importantly it is discouraging young people discouraging talented new people who want to get into the party get into the system and this is and more importantly it is corroding the very vitals the foundation blocks of this country's parliamentary democracy that is the political parties themselves as young people of this country what hope can we have what what changes can we bring to this friends i agree that there are many other pressing issues that this country needs to tackle not one of our higher education institutes in this country figure in the top 200 in the world in the past 10 years every single year on an average more than 15000 farmers are committing suicides there are millions of people in this country who do not have adequate square meals two square meals a day i agree that there are many pressing challenges but you and i should understand that all these challenges can be long lasting solutions to all these problems can be found if we correct this political system this is the mother of all problems so how do we do this there are a lot of innovative solutions say prop for example if we want to curb the influence of caste in the electoral scenario can we cut and resize our constituencies in such a way 
that no one caste or no one religion becomes the decisive majority. Can we also, insta in, in, instead of the first past the post system, bring in 50% plus one vote to win system? Can we also bring systems like preferential voting, which will induce and encourage voters and political parties to appeal to the electorate on broad-based issues rather than sectarian and, nor uh, and sectarian and narrow appeals. Thankfully, even 65 years after our journey as a republic, not one political party had come forward to stop the menace of criminals in politics. Thankfully, the Supreme Court intervened and we have this uh, or Supreme Court order which bans convicted, convicted criminals from entering the parliament. Can we go a step ahead? Can we think of how to prevent people with criminal antecedents to even enter the system? Can we bring in a legislation which bars people who have been charge cheated of committing heinous, heinous offenses? Six months prior to the parliament, prior to the elections, can we bar such people from contesting elections until the completion of their trials? And then we come to the question of money, and this is a very complex question. Can we think of new solutions? Can we talk to stakeholders who are involved in the political process? Can we think whether state funding of elections will help reduce this problem? Can we think of more effective and effective on enforcement measures to curb the, measure, curb the menace of freebies during elections? Can we think of institutionalizing mechanisms through which transparent funding for political parties and candidates can be brought about? And to address the problem at its root, can we also think of tackling and pumping out the black money from the country's system? If we are successful in doing this, this is going to have a large impact on the country's political scenario. One, it is not only going to make this whole politics of return on investment model politics go away, but more importantly, it will encourage new people who come from modest backgrounds. It is going to encourage you and me, normal people, to get into the political system and try to change the political system for the better. More importantly, Today, most of the political parties function, and if you look at the second generation leaders in most of our political parties, they are all dynasts. And the reason that they are there where they are is because they, have, they are inheritors of both the monetary and the political, leg political legacy of their fathers and their family. If we can curb the menace of power and menace of money in, in, the, in the political system, then there will definitely be a reasonable amount of internal democracy in the party. Today, none of the political parties can actually think of bringing political internal democracy in any party. Friends, all of this can be done. It's very simple. You need not have a constitutional amendment for many of these suggestions that I told. Simple amendments to a few statutes here and there is, will suffice, it will, will serve the purpose. But the question is, who will do it? The question is, will the ones who are presently occupying these positions, the present lot, will they deliver these goods? How can those people who are benefiting from the status quo usher in change? So who will bell the cat? The answer is right before me. In the youth of this country, in the young people of this country, you and I have to take this initiative. We have to go forward. Armchair cynics will say that this is a very difficult uh, proposition. Our plans and dreams are mere wishful thinking. But not all is lost. We need not lose hope. Let me give a small anecdote. Let me uh, narrate before you a small anecdote that, that is very touching and in fact shows why there is hope in the political system of this country. In the last assembly elections in Karnataka, uh, in the um, locality where I stay, the two major contending parties um, organized, uh, you know, free holy trips for the people of the constituency, all paid expenses trips for the people of the constituency. 
So one political party organized the Tirthyatra to Shirdi and the other party organized the Tirthyatra to Tirupati. Um, many people, lot of them went to the Tirth Yatra and apparently all those people who went on the Yatra were made to promise before the God that they would be voting for this person and this party who had organized this free trip. Very interestingly, there was this one very old woman who had been to both these trips. I asked her, but she told I hadn't been to Shirdi, neither had I been to um, uh, Thirupati, so they were organizing a free trip. I thought, why shouldn't I go? Then I asked her, they have made you promise before God, how do you manage that conflict of interest? She's a very poor lady, you know, uh, old poor lady and not this urban cosmopolitan uh, person. The answer she gave me just baffled me. She told me that... Uh, at every holy place she went, she offered some money before God and begged her forgiveness and forgiveness because she would be breaking the promise because she intended to vote for a third candidate who in her opinion was better qualified and competent than the other two people who organized these free Tirthyatras for her. This is how we need to change the system in this country, my dear friends. By pinning our hopes, by pinning our energies, and by reposing our faith in the common people of this country. For they are seeking a better future for themselves and for this country. Friends, we need to make and build a fair and a more egalitarian political system where any one of us sitting here, people coming from modest backgrounds, people coming from backgrounds which do not have a political legacy, you and I can think of becoming the prime ministers of this country in such a way that we can stake, we can stake our claim in such a way that we can stake our claim to occupy the highest offices in that country on the capable, on, on, based on the sheer fact of our competency, integrity and our capability. I would like to leave you all with the ominous words of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, one of the principal architects of the country's constitution, which he spoke on the constituent assembly of this country. He said, however good the constitution may be, it may turn out to be a bad constitution if the people who are called to work it are a bad lot. However good a constitution may be, however bad a constitution may be, if the people who are called to work on it are a good lot, the constitution will be good. You and I have to decide, you and I have to take a pledge. The founding fathers of this country gave all of us a sublime constitution. You and I have to resolve and let us resolve for today and for the posterity and for the future of this country. Let us not leave politics to be the last resort of the scoundrel. Thank you.